Good morning, everybody. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Bert Upson, uh, former Newport resident. Uh, he's here to present his miraculous story of his escape from the 78th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. He has uh, written a book, which I haven't read, uh, called On a Clear Day, uh, which has been identified as a remarkable history of 9-11. Uh, it has numerous accolades, and the book is available uh, after the meeting. If you'd like to pick up a copy, I certainly will be. Uh, after graduation from Yale University in 1955, Upson entered the U.S. Army as a lieutenant in the field artillery, was stationed at Fort Ord in California. In uh, 1960, he became an account manager uh, in the advertising agency business on Madison Avenue, uh, later moving to VP of advertising for a packaging company. In the 80s, he moved to Newport, and started a company called CEO Inc., uh, a corporate management development firm serving the East Coast from Boston to New York City. He serves in countless civic and military associations, been a guest speaker at many of these. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we are lucky to have this fine author and hero with us today. I'd like to introduce our welcome, Mr. Bert Upson of the stage. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. Okay, thank you very much. I didn't prompt her either. <laughs> a minute and a half of my life would have made the difference whether I was here or not. What you're going to see and hear today is my personal account of what happened on 9-11, not just to the collision and collapse of the towers, which is my specialty because that's where I was on 9-11, but also for the rest of my harrowing day, which was spent trying to survive in lower Manhattan. I have all of 25 or so minutes to deliver to you what happened in the whole day and since that time also up to the period of the crisis that we're in now that we may not be fully aware of. So that makes my talk even more appropriate because what I'm trying to do is bring the memory of 9-11 up to the surface and carry it along to as many people as I can. Yes, I would love to sell some books, but my main mission in life now is to tell the story. On 9-11, 2,800 people died that day. More deaths from 9-11 than Union soldiers killed at Gettysburg. The attack was over in one hour and 15 minutes. It's the shortest air war in military history. 20% of Americans knew of someone who was killed or damaged in the attack. I have yet to meet another survivor 12 years later. I don't know where they all went. 9-11 was the largest exodus, I don't know if you knew this, it's important to know it, of, of humans, the largest exodus of humans in history by water, including Dunwork and, Dunkirk in World War II. This is a true miracle of human endeavor. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. It was also the largest elevator catastrophe in history. 200 or more frightened souls burning to death because they couldn't release the new locks on the elevator doors. I was in one of those elevators, but our locks opened, thank God. Firefighters and paramedics lost 30% of their rescue team. This was an unusual tragedy for the 343 firefighters who, because of faulty communications, didn't get the word from their commander to abandon the building now. Fires burned at ground zero for 99 days. The South Tower was hit 16 minutes after the North Tower. I was in the South Tower, but was the first to fall. Both towers fell to the ground in less than 10 seconds. The FAA managed to get another miracle of the day. 
The FAA managed to get 4,400 planes out of the sky and down to safety with that mishap in less than an hour. Uh, it's rather incredible. Incredible job by the pilots. Over 422,000 New Yorkers suffered from PTSD. You're looking at one of them. Illness from toxic dust exposure numbered 18,000. You're looking at one of them. It was the largest gold heist in history, $300 billion stolen from the South Tower where I was during the period right after the bombing. And 20% or more of the scrap steel also disappeared. People ask me how and why, I don't know. I don't know that anybody, except those who stole it, took it, knew. I'm going to need help from someone to advance. <coughs> Mr. McFarland here. Thank you, yeah. Noted author himself of a book called Aftershock. Now, what you're going to do, Jim, excuse me, folks, just give me a minute here. When I say next, you push this one. Okay? Down yeah. It's nice to have good help, especially from someone I consider my mentor who helped me keep me on a narrow, straight and narrow path when I was putting together my book. That familiar picture? This is a drawing done for me by an artist. It's not exactly accurate. We took a little creative license with it because both buildings weren't hit at the same time and this makes it look as though they were. And this is where I was, 78th floor of the South Tower, which was also the express elevator stop and the only express elevator in the building. So I'm gonna get right into the presentation because of your great generosity of time of giving me 30 minutes. But I wanna save a little bit for question and answer. Those are the towers. How many of you have been to New York and seen the South Towers when they were? Okay, those are the two towers. They reach about 1,360 feet high, and the new Freedom Tower is 1,776 feet high, as you may know, but there they were next. Next, wake up. <laughs> Next. Okay. This is a picture of the, of the actual area. Uh, the significance is that those are the towers, one through five, that either got hit by the planes, two of them got hit by the planes, the North Tower and the South Tower, and the other ones went down from fire caused by parts that fell off the planes. Next. Next. <laughs> Would you save your coffee for later, please? This guy has three coffee cups. I saw him in the car the other day with one that looked just like this. <laughs> this is the first plane that hit from Boston with uh, about 9,000 gallons of high octane jet fuel. And that one hit at 8.46 a.m. And this one, which hit my tower, hit at 9.03.02 a.m. Next! <laughs> <laughs> and this is the area, it's about 48 block, 48 acres of territory. And the ones in the, in the middle here, the, the gray ones, uh, the tall, two tall of the towers that were hit, the other gray ones are the other towers. And this right here is the Marriott Hotel where I was going to stay the night before and probably would have returned there during the attack. It was taken out. I was in a hotel about five blocks away at William and Mary Street, south of the World Trade Center. The red buildings were buildings that were so badly damaged they had to be uh, demolished. And then the, the kind of over the yellow ones uh, were ones that needed major repair, and all the gray ones around were sufficiently damaged that they needed to be fixed up. And a lot of it was 
toxic uh, insulation. Next. Uh, we weren't the only country that lost people on 9-11. There was something like 132 companies that had people working there that day. Next. This is Mohammed Atta, the gang leader. Uh, won't say too much about him, but he was the brains masterminding the actual attack. He lives in Delray, Florida. How they communicated with each other, with the other 18 terrorists, I, I don't know. But they did, and they did a pretty good job of it. He commissioned one of the terrorists to build a model, a live, a big model of the 767 in his apartment so that the terrorists could meet there and practice what they were going to do when they got on the planes. They also studied all the protocols of what went on in the planes and flight deck <coughs> with the cabin attendants and the pilots. And security, they flew these planes. They picked planes leaving at about the same time early in the morning. And the reason they did that was why? Because they figured there'd be less chance of delay if they took the first plane out. And they wanted the transcontinental flights because they figured they'd be full of, full of fuel. Next, this is the flight path of the planes. I'll tell you my story in a minute, but this is the flight path. And you'll see the one up in the upper right hand corner, that's the first flight that left Boston early in the, mor in the morning and hit the North Tower at 846. Then plane number two is up in the right hand corner, hit my building at 846 a.m. and hit the 78th floor where I'd been standing just a few moments before it hit. Interestingly enough, it flew down over southern New Jersey and flew over the Indian Point nuclear facility. And the other two planes, I'm not knowledgeable about, I'm not an expert on anything here, but they, they went from either Dulles International or from Newark, and one was headed for the White House, there was some confusion about where people thought they were headed. And I'll tell you, they were headed for the White House. They weren't headed for the Congress building, they were headed for the White House. And the reason for that is they hit the North, the Trade Center, which was, which was finance. They hit the Defense Department, which was defense. And they were going to the White House to get our leadership. And by the way, this was not an attack on the buildings necessarily. This was an attack on the United States, represented by the building, but the plan was that this would cause other related Al-Qaeda members to join forces to increase their ranks for a world war, a world <coughs> revolution. <coughs> Next. Asset Tower, where I stayed, or went, and got there about 8.35 or 8. 40 in the morning, I had breakfast at the hotel I was staying in, five blocks away, called the Club Quarters. Pretty, wasn't it? It was absolutely beautiful. It took about five or ten minutes to get through security. And I arrived on the 78th floor at 7.45 a.m. And at 7.46, it all started. Boom! The building shook, the hackles went up on the back of my neck, the air pressure dropped, and I said to myself, this is a big one. This is not a regular attack, this is a, this is a big one. Now then I didn't know whether it was a plane, a guided missile, I thought perhaps it was the beginning of a nuclear war. And though, I had to make a decision, do I stay in the building or do I get out? So I made the decision to get out. Why, I don't know, but some little voice said, get out. And I went back to the conference room, next. I looked out the window. These are a little washed out because these are drawings from the book and they're not in color. I looked out the window and I noticed this stuff shooting by. Turns out it was going by at about 75 miles an hour. It was very little pieces. It looked like, I thought it was confetti, and I thought there was a parade in town. 
It wasn't confetti. What was a clear day, which is the name of the book, was no longer a clear day. Next. Next. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I should look at the screen. I said to the group, let's go. Ever hear that command? How many of you are in the military? Ever hear, follow me? You look around and nobody's following you. Well, I said, follow me. I looked around and about 10 people were following me, 13, 11. Three stayed. Three of our group of 14 stayed. They didn't leave the tower. So I was with a woman who knew where the exit was. I didn't know where it was. So she took me to the exit. People were following us. Now there's a mob. People were coming from the upper floors and the lower floors to get to the 78th floor to take the express elevator. <coughs> so we got there and looked up and I saw that sign over the elevator. What's that sign say in the case of emergency? Yeah, and I said, no way, Jose. That's, those weren't my exact words, but you get the idea. We decided to get on the elevator. Well, it's not that easy because the elevator doors were closed. And eventually they miraculously opened to let us on. Well, the elevators hold 55 people, and about two or 300 people were trying to get on that elevator at the same time. And we finally got on, and we pushed the people in front of us to push the people in front of them out the doors. Otherwise, the elevator doors would not have closed. So finally they closed, and I can still hear, and this really gives me a moment of pause, I can still hear people on the other side of the door saying, please don't go without me. Let me in. Let me on. Save me. I still can hear it. So, elevator doors closed, and as the elevator started down, I said to myself, this thing will probably crash. I'll die because it crashes. I'll die because we're, we're in a war. I'll die because of fire. Or I'll die because I'm going to be crushed to death with this mob. Now, just before we got on the elevator, I heard on the loudspeaker, ladies and gentlemen, it is not our building that was hit. It was the North Tower that was hit. It's all right to go back to your offices as far as we know. I remember those words exactly. <coughs> Something you remember you'll never forget. I'll never forget that. So some people took that as a request to go back to their offices, and three of the people who were with us stayed in the conference room. Next, <coughs> we got downstairs, and another noise, bang! This was even louder than the first one. The first one was muffled because it was in the North Tower, and I was in the South Tower. Just as they said, bang, I looked up. And this is what I saw. A minute and a half after I left, decided to leave the building, this is, this is where I was. That's why I said earlier, but for a minute and a half, I wouldn't be here. Now, people are running down the streets from here. Uh, I could hear screaming, screaming people. I didn't know what they were screaming for. They were screaming because they were the jumpers. 110 people jumped or more. The odor in the air was fetid. The odor in the air was overwhelming. The fireball behind us was coming along fairly fast. Part of this is in my imagination, but I think I saw a fireball coming behind me and had good reason to, and there was stuff falling off the buildings around us. So we were in a war, all right. We were in a war. We still are. So we started running, and as we ran, Next, well that's the picture of what I saw next. There we are running next. The woman I was with got knocked down and was going to be trampled to death. Now I had to make another decision. The first one was do I stay or go? The second one was do I take the elevator or take the stairs? The third one was do I stop and pick her up or not? And my inclination was not to pick her up. I was running for my life. And then some things said, you know, you can't do that. You'd never be able to live with that. Stop and pick her up. Stop to pick her up. She was bloody and bruised. The guy behind her didn't even stop, didn't even look around, didn't say he was sorry, he just kept running. <coughs> so she says, I saved her life, and that's why they call me a hero. There are a lot of other things I did, too, but I don't need to be called a hero. 
Uh, that doesn't mean it, that doesn't, it, I did what I had to do. Next. And there's the hotel. This is going to be an abbreviated story of what went on in that hotel. But as soon as I got there, we decided to stop running for the East River, which is where we were going to go to jump in the river. I saw that light. It's cloudy now with dust and smoke and ash, soot. So we went in. First thing I did was to take over the dining room and put out all the burners underneath the chafing dishes. Then I went into the kitchen and located the fire extinguisher and put somebody in front of it. The kitchen staff was mesmerized. By now, the pictures were on television so I could see what had happened. I still didn't believe what had happened. I thought I was looking at a, at a reenactment of something, some, somebody's imagination. Well, I put somebody in charge of the fire extinguisher and then the manager came out and saw what I was doing. The kitchen staff thought I was the new manager because I was bossing them all around. Why I was doing this, I don't know. I just don't know. Don't need to know. So she said, would you mind closing the bar? Oh, I said, well, I wouldn't mind at all. I'd be delighted to help with that. So I went over to the bar, and there are these three Australians drinking their Foster Ale. Now, if you ever try to separate a Foster from his Foster's Ale, let me tell you, it's not easy. And these are big boys. These are big boys. Well, finally they got the word, and they, and they, and they left. So now I've got to cap the bottles. The problem was I couldn't find the caps to the bottles. So I had some saran wrap. I found some saran wrap. I was tearing saran wrap. Now here I am in what I originally thought was a nuclear war, tearing up pieces of saran wrap to put on liquor bottles. So I got to the vodka. I said to myself, you know, I better save a little bit out for myself just in case of an emergency. I might need it. So I poured a big glass of vodka, biggest glass I could find, and I took it upstairs to my room, tried to call my wife, couldn't connect with her, and put the glass of vodka down by my computer where I started sending out emails to everybody in the world I could think of, telling them how upset I was and how angry I was, how frightened I had been. And I looked at that glass of vodka and I said, you know, if you drink that, you'll never get out of here. Because now smoke is coming up the, up the elevators and the stairwells to the 17th floor where I was. Uh, you'll never get out of here. So I didn't drink it now. Back down I go to the main floor, go over to the chef and say, how, how are we going to feed people? we got 50 or 60 people in here. How are we going to possibly feed them? He said, well, that's easy. I said, what do you mean that's easy? He said, we order out Chinese. So he did. Within an hour, three Chinamen showed up with trays. This is hard to believe how they got across the police lines, how they got over the barricades, how they got from Chinatown down to us, I don't know what they did. Well, it filled a fantasy of mine. And my fantasy was that all the kitchens in Chinese restaurants are fake. <clears throat> okay? they're, all, they're all fake. The menus, they're all printed in the same place because they're all basically the same. They have the same names and descriptions on them. I figured it out, aha. Uh -huh. There is a secret Chinese kitchen under the streets of New York. <laughs> and furthermore, they have their own secret subway system. That's how they did it. Now, I told you I had some PTSD. I think that, I think that was one of the first indications there was something, something wrong. 3.30, they turned the water off in the hotel. They needed the water put out the fires. It took 99 days to put the fires out. 99 days to put the fires out. At 4.30, they told us they were turning the electricity off because they needed the electricity for lighting, <coughs> which is no longer ground zero, is now referred to as the pile. And later it was called the hole. So it was the pile. They needed the electricity. So we were given a warning to get out of the hotel. They couldn't be responsible. For our safety, I'm on the 15th floor at this point, so I had to walk down 15 stairs. I grabbed some stuff and put it under my arm, my case. I don't even remember whether I took my computer or not. Usually, that's the first thing that I take. And I made a beeline for the east side of New York to get the subway north. I wanted to get out of lower Manhattan. About that time, I'll tell you a little more about it, was the biggest beginning of the biggest 
lift by water uh, in the history of the world on the, on the west side. And I found out later on the south side and on, on the east side of Manhattan, because there was no way to get off the island. Island, the Bay of Giuliani had locked down New York. Well, I took off, and I'm heading for the subway, and I run into a cop, and he said, you can't go east, you've got to go south. I said, no, I want to go east, and I lied about my physical condition, telling him I had heart problems and couldn't see very well. I don't know what I told him, and he said, listen, buddy, I don't have time for this. Just do what I tell you to do. So I went south. Next. <coughs> Well, that's me comforting a woman who came in earlier. Next, this is the weapon of, I call this the world's smallest weapon of mass destruction. This is a case cutter. This is an example of what the terrorists use on the planes and any other weapons they had. Uh, if you don't believe it, it has a, a blade about that long, about three-eighths of an inch, but it can cut, it can cut the carotid artery with no problem at all. Next. That's the South Tower, I think. That's the lobby where I was. That's in. Next. More of the same. I just show a few of these. I don't want to show you all the gory pictures. I just want to remind you of what happened that day. Next. Next. That's the last remaining structure. I think it was in the Federal Building. Next. That's what I might have looked like on the streets. Next. Next. <coughs> Next, that's the Bucket Brigade. Do you know anything about the Bucket Brigade, what it was doing there? These were people who were volunteers. These, these were ham radio operators. They were, they were construction workers. They were uh, subway workers. What were the buckets for? The mains. Yeah, they sent the buckets up empty. And they came back down full. Next, there's Old Glory. Later on, the old glory was planted uh, all over the pile. I heard my building fall. I didn't see it, but I looked up out the, out the door. I went out the door of the hotel, having been told not to go out. I went out anyway, and I looked up, and my building was gone. Next. Okay, this is a, this is a representation of the guy who stopped me. Now, if you're running down the streets of New York in the dark, and you're running something like this, you tend to want to stop. So I stopped, and that's when he told me to turn the other way and go south. And it's getting really dark now, and I was lost anyway. It took me three hours to get maybe 15 minutes. Well, he, he convinced me I should go south. Next, here I am being confronted by three big boys in their late teens or early 20s, and they told me they were from Brooklyn, they'd come over to see what was going on. They asked me for my autograph. I said, well, I'm sorry, I'd love to give you my autograph, but I left my pen in the hotel because I was in such a hurry to get out. Silence. And then they said, by the way, do you have any money on you? Then I knew. I knew what was about to happen. So. I'm no longer worried about dying in the elevator. I'm worried about dying in the streets of New York. So just at that moment, when I told them I left my wallet back in the hotel because I was in such a hurry to get out, they didn't believe that. Then the SWAT team member showed up, and he scared them off. And he chatted with me for a moment. He said, those boys are not from Brooklyn. They're from a lower east, east side gang and they go out to kill, murder, rob, or rape people. I wasn't worried about rape, but I'd say other stuff I was kind of worried about. So they saved my life. Next. The, do the dogs, the, the miraculous dogs. There were 110 rescue dogs. I don't know if you knew that. And later on, about two weeks later, another 200 uh, comfort dogs came in to comfort the workers. This is a picture I saw in a restaurant in King City, and I got a picture of it, put it up here, because it says so much, don't you think? It really says so much. All those dogs are gone now. They've all died. A lot of them died of, can of lung cancer. Next. This is the miracle of miracles. The Coast Guard came, and the commander put out the, the call. 
calling all available boats. Something like 143 boats showed up of all sizes and shapes and descriptions, tour boats, passenger ferries, tugboats. I have a list of all the tugboats in the book. Put those in there to honor the, the men and the women who donated their tugboats. It risks themselves, it risks their insurance, using their own fuel to come take a half million people off the shores of New York. Take a look at it, it's on the air, on the internet, the boat lifters. Next. That's another shot from the water. Next. That's the USNS Comfort that came up from Norfolk about three days later. It's a thousand bed hospital ship, provided services to 843 workers. A lot of them had broken limbs, they had smoke inhalation problems, or they were nervous wrecks, so they gave them help. They had, they had paramedics, they had doctors, they had psychiatrists, psychologists, you name it, they had it on that ship. And a few months ago I met the woman who was the uh, admiral <coughs> who commissioned that ship and got her ready to come to New York to save, uh, to help these people. Hex. The F-15s were our first line of defense. I've got one outside here, take a look at it. It's a, they're beautiful aircraft. I even went up to have my picture taken with one in, in in northern New York, because I wanted to see see one. Uh, they, they never really got into action. Too little, too late. Story is in my in my book, and it's kind of interesting. But there it is. This was the first line of defense, and they they circled our country and and guarded the borders and the waters. Formidable. Next, another shot. Next, that's the F-15. I have a picture of the two pilots. I haven't met them, but I did meet, I did meet the pilot of, the, of, of United 175 who was supposed to fly that day. And he traded off with his partner. His partner wanted to take that flight. I met him three weeks ago. Next. I have met some incredible people on my journey to keep the, alive what happened on 9-11. That's the USS New York. It was uh, next. Next, next, next. It was uh, it was commissioned and sent to New York Harbor in 2008. It was the largest. It's, it's not a, a battleship. I don't know what it is, but it's the biggest there is. And the hull was made of recycled steel. Some of you Navy people may know it was made of recycled steel from the towers. Next, these are the Land Rovers. There are two of them that have recycled material in them in the flag of America, the United States, on them. They're flying around the globe. They'll be representing us flying around the globe for the next one million years. So they, whoever looks at those won't forget about 9-11. Next, that's the George Bush. It's out of focus. I left it there intentionally because it shows he was rather frazzled and he wrote me the nicest letter which I have at home. I, I don't bring it because I don't want to get into a political discussion about George W. Bush. Next, bullhorn address. Next, the bad guy. He was a bad guy. I had a nightmare when I went back to California to Bodega Bay to, re to recover, I, that he had attacked our beach with the Al Qaeda. In my nightmare, I grabbed two AK-47. Remember John Wayne movies? Well, I went down to the beach with my AK-47s. I shot them all. I saved him for last, and I shot him in the face. And I met the brother of the man who actually did shoot him in the face a few months ago. Next. We finally got him. This is his resume. Next. Oh, by the way, Bin Laden was the brains behind the operation. But Sheikh Khali Mohammed was the real genius. And he wanted to attack 10 cities, 10 towers, and three nuclear facilities and Bin Laden nixed it because it was just too much to take on. The logistics were, were horrific and something could go wrong and blow the whole deal. So he decided on the three, on the, on the three, on the two tower, on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and the White House. Next, this is a tribute to 9-11. Next, is that it? That's it. 
I have another one of the towers, I have another one of the piles, but it is, it's just too much to show. And all I want to say now was that I stayed in New York for another week. The next day I went to the library to research the, the um, mission statements of the CIA and the FBI and the White House and everything else I could get my hands on to find out whose fault it was and I was angry and I wanted to fix the, plan, uh, fix the blame and I wanted to go get them. Uh, I also was going to uh, sign up 13 of my singing buddies from Yale and commission them all and I had positions for each of them to go f find Bin Laden and kill him. So my mind was working overtime, let me tell you. And I did recover. I went to the hospital in Petaluma where I found out I had uh, the lung problem but it was temporary and the doctor there told me that he was a doctor in residence in South Tower on 9-11, another coincidence and I had many more of those coincidences since I've traveled around California telling my story. So, uh, but I want to say this one thing, I think today we're in a more perilous situation than we ever were and I want to get the word out and I need to get it down to the younger generations and thank God finally a year and a half after going on my tour I've been invited to go to a junior college so I'll be talking to a group of younger people uh, who, who, who do want to know about 9-11 and they feel they need to know more about it. So if you get a book, don't think of it as buying a book. And part of the proceeds go to the Wounded Warriors Fund. Think of it as taking home a piece of 9-11 and sharing it with other people in your life. I say to the tourists, uh, if the terrorists go away, they probably thought they were tourists because they were treated as tourists on planes due to the plane protocol. But go away. Don't come back, we never want to see you again. We're gonna hunt you down until we destroy the will of the last one of you standing so that you will not be a threat to the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. I'll take some questions if there are any, if we have time. Yes, sir. Um, there are other thoughts to why the towers uh, came down. Can you comment on that? On the what? Are there theories about how the towers? Oh, there are a lot of theories, and they're all wrong. So out of everyone I've seen, except mine, <laughs> <laughs> the towers went down, and the second tower that I was on went down first because it was hit lower, 78th floor. The north tower was hit around the 90th floor, so the south tower had more weight above it than the north tower. So, because of the momentum, if you ever study momentum theory, I have and I don't understand it. But it, if something falls, it gains, it gains speed faster. Yeah, seconds per second per second. That's why the, the uh, then it, 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 when they went down because the planes hit them. I called the head of the architect of the uh, yeah the architecture department of of MIT, who's a friend of mine. I said, Bill, how did they fall? All these theories about and ciliary uh, bombs being put in the building. Had somebody put bombs in the buildings to go off at the exact moment the plane hit? No way, no way. He said, Bert, the buildings just fell. This is a professor, professor for they just fell. Yes? I wasn't aware of it at the time of the significance of the World Trade Center, but I have a picture at home in my office with my granddaughter sitting on a fence with towers behind her, taken by her. That's wonderful. I have a book I just got from a photographer named Jay Maisel, and he sent me this as a gift of pictures he had taken since he first saw the towers. He had a bedroom window overlooking the towers. He put a box on so he could stand up and take photographs. So, so I, I admire that what she's got. Next time, bring it. Yes. You mentioned from the very first time you heard the explosion, you thought you were being attacked. Yeah. What made you think that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it's a sixth sense. It's a sixth sense. Just it was that, that feeling that there's something really wrong. I, I don't know where it came from. But you thought Born again Christians think it was God that came in and told me, or Jesus, I don't know which one, came in and told me, and I don't know. Maybe it was a higher power. Maybe. There was something mystical going on. I don't know, but my body said it's a reaction. 
You ever been in a situation where you go like this and you're not sure why? Like the boogeyman coming into your bedroom at night when you're a little kid? <laughs> yes, sir. You uh, didn't finish the story about the elevator. I'm dying to know when you got down to the ground floor, successfully, obviously, there was no way that elevator was going to move again, correct? Well, what happened was I got outside, the second plane hits. By then, the, ele the elevator was going back up. Went back up to 78, people got on it, came down. By the time it got to the 33rd floor, the second plane hit. The elevator stopped and those people were trapped. Some of them crawled out. My boss crawled out and came down 30. He was able to get down to 33 floors because the buildings hadn't started their collapse yet. Anybody else? Yes, sir. How many people did you say jump? Well, they're varying reports. The last one I've read is 110, but some people think they're more like 200. And they were running away. They were. This was not an active act to commit suicide. This was fear to to get to get away. So they either had to hide somewhere they thought in the building or get out. They decided to run for it, and of course they couldn't see where they were running. And a lot of them had already the windows had already imploded, and so they just jumped out. They went out the windows. They might have thought they were going down the hallway. I don't know. But, um, okay. Yes? The lady that you picked up, where had you been in contact, have you been in contact with her since the... No. No, I, I called Carol and tried to get her supported with my book and get her to write. That, well, her name really wasn't Carol. I changed the name of the book because she did not want to be identified. She did not want to talk to me about it. She did not want to send me uh, her notes on what happened to her. She wanted to completely forget about it. The other, th the other, uh, the other ones I, I never knew because they didn't work for me. And I was a consultant at the time, going to give a lecture on how to invent your future. Mister Barlow, would you like to comment on why you waited ten years to write the book? Something happened because it was so fresh in my memory every day. I was thinking about it whenever. I have poor hearing because of artillery fire, but I can hear the plane better than any, almost anybody else coming over. But I can hear that plane, I know, and I look up. So every time, this, this went on for about 10 years, and I was so, con or a sound. If somebody dropped a, a garbage th a th a thing on the ground, I've heard this point, unusual sounds. I don't know if those of you have been in the war, but those unusual sounds always got my attention. And it got to the point where I said, you know, you, you just got to write this book. I took a creative writing course, and I handed in a paper didn't have anything to do with the World Trade Center. I started writing about it, and then I would quit, and then I would cry, and then I would start writing again, and then it would bother me. So I had to get over the hurdle of it and just go free form and start writing. I took a creative writing course, and and in a paper on, on my ice skating adventures as a child, young child. And she wrote back on it, you tell a good story. And as soon as she said that, I said, I'm on. I'm off and running, I'm gonna write the book. I talked to a couple of my best friends, and they said, write, write the book. So I got encouragement from friends, and they got encouragement from the writing course, and something happened uh, again. It was a miracle that I was able to do it. And I, this is the only book that I know that's a history of 9-11. There are a lot of fragments, books written about the dog, books written about the planes, books written about that this is, this is the, it's a condensed history of 9-11. Because once I started writing my story, I said, I want to know more. And that's what happened. So, not really a good answer, but so I don't really know that something happened in the year. It's like that little sense that said, get out of the building, something said, write it. Of course, then I was in the Palm Desert Writers Guild, and I got, he was the president, and I got a lot of encouragement. He doesn't know it, but he was my mentor. Anybody else? Well, I thank you kindly. Oh! When the buildings fell, and all that dust started to fill up, was it mostly asbestos? It was asbestos, and it was concrete. And it was all the stuff that was in the building, the paper, the desks, the carpeting, uh, it was all, all that stuff. And by the way, that, that hit of that building was so powerful, so powerful, 
that was felt on the Richter scale in Maine, 2.3 on the Richter scale. Now that's amazing. Plus, there were some body parts found over in New Jersey from the impact of that, of that plane. Okay. All right. Thank you. I describe it to you and sign it for you. No extra charge. <laughs> Thank you so much.